An Old Story by Edwin Arlington Robinson Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shona Bargdon Sturble Strange that I did not know him then, that friend of mine. I did not even show him then one friendly sign, but cursed him for the ways he had to make me see my envy of the praise he had for praising me. I would have rid the earth of him once in my pride. I never knew the worth of him until he died. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At night by Sarah Pinsel. Read for LibriVox.org by Sudesh. We are apart. The city grows quite between. She hushes herself, for midnight makes heavy her eyes. The tangle of traffic is ended. The cars are empty. Five streets divide us, and on them the moonlight flies. Oh, are you asleep or lying awake, my lover? Open your dreams to my love and your heart to my words. I send you my thoughts. The air between us is laden. My thoughts flying at your window, a flock of wild birds. End of quote. This recording is in the public domain. A Word to the Elect by Anne Bronte Read for LibriVox.org by Margaret Brichon A Word to the Elect You may rejoice to think yourself secure. You may be grateful for the gift divine, that grace unsought which made your black hearts pure and fits your earth-born souls in heaven to shine. But is it sweet to look around and view thousands excluded from that happiness which they deserved at least as much as you, their faults not greater nor their virtues less? And wherefore should you love your God the more? Because to you alone his smiles are given, because he chose to pass the many over, and only bring the favored few to heaven. And wherefore should your hearts more grateful prove, because for all the Savior did not die? Is yours the God of justice and of love? And are your bosoms warm with charity? Say, does your heart expand to all mankind? And would you ever to your neighbor do, the weak, the strong, the enlightened, and the blind, as you would have your neighbor do to you? And when you, looking on your fellow men, behold them doomed to endless misery, how can you talk of joy and rapture then? May God withhold such cruel joy from me, that none deserve eternal bliss I know, unmerited the grace and mercy given, but none shall sink to everlasting woe, that have not well deserved the wrath of heaven. And oh, there lives within my heart a hope long nursed by me, and should its cheering ray depart, how dark my soul would be that as in Adam all have died, in Christ shall all men live, and ever round his throne abide eternal praise to give, that even the wicked shall at last be fitted for the skies, and when their dreadful doom is past, to life and light arise. I ask not how remote the day, nor what the sinner's woe, before their dross is purged away, enough for me to know, that when the cup of wrath is drained, the metal purified, they'll cling to what they once disdained, and live by him that died. End of A Word to the Elect. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad by the Fire by Edwin Arlington Robinson Recorded for LibriVox.org by Shona Brogdon Sturble Slowly I smoke and hug my knee, the while... A witless masquerade of things that only children see floats in a mist of light and shade. They pass a flimsy cavalcade, and with a weak, remindful glow, the falling embers break and fade as one by one the phantoms go. Then with a melancholy glee to think where once my fancy strayed, I muse on what the years may be whose coming tales are all unsaid, till tongs and shovel, 
snugly laid within their shattered niches, grow by grim degrees to pick and spade as one by one the phantoms go. But then, what though the mystic three around me ply their merry trade? And Sharon soon may carry me across the gloomy Stygian glade. But then, what though the mystic three around me ply their merry trade? And Karen soon may carry me across the gloomy Stygian glade. Be up, my soul, be not afraid of what some unborn year may show. But mind your human debts are paid, as one by one the phantoms go. Envoy Life is the game that must be played, this truth at least, good friend, we know. So live and laugh, nor be dismayed, as one by one the phantoms go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Butterfly in Church by George Marion McClellan Recorded for LibriVox.org by Jerry Hendershot University Park, Maryland A Butterfly in Church What dost thou hear, thou shining, sinless thing, with many-colored hues and shapely wing? Why quit the open field and summer air to flutter here? Thou hast no need of prayer. Tis meet that we, who this great structure built, Should come to be redeemed and washed from guilt, For we, this gilded edifice within, Are come with erring hearts and stains of sin. But thou art free from guilt as God on high. Go, seek the blooming waste and open sky, And leave us here our secret woes to bear. Confessionals and agonies of prayer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chicago Poet by Carl Sandberg Read for LibriVox.org by Dennis D. I saluted a nobody. I saw him in a looking glass. He smiled. So did I. He crumpled the skin on his forehead, frowning. So did I. Everything I did, he did. I said, Hello, I know you. And I was a liar to say so. Ah, uh, the looking glass man. Liar, fool, dreamer, play actor, soldier. Dusty drinker of dust. Uh, he will go with me down the dark stairway when nobody else is looking. When everybody else is gone, he locks his elbow in mine. I lose all, but not him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cliff Klingenhagen by Edwin Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Robinson, Carbondale, Illinois Cliff Klingenhagen had me in to dine with him one day, and, after soup and meat and all the other things there were to eat, Cliff took two glasses and filled one with wine and one with wormwood. Then, without a sign for me to choose at all, he took the draught of bitterness himself and lightly quaffed it off and said the other one was mine. 
And when I asked him what the deuce he meant by doing that, he only looked at me and smiled and said it was a way of his. And though I know the fellow, I've spent a long time wondering when I shall be as happy as Cliff Klingenhagen is. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Death is Before Me Today by Anonymous. Read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Cooper. Death is Before Me Today, like the recovery of a sick man like going forth into a garden after sickness. Death is before me today, like the odor of myrrh, like sitting under the sail on a windy day. Death is before me today, like the odor of lotus flowers, like sitting on the shore of drunkenness. Death is before me today, like the course of the freshet, like the return of a man from the war galley to his house. Death is before me today, like the clearing of the sky, like a man following therein toward that which he knew not. Death is before me today, as a man longs to see his house when he has spent years in captivity. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Experience by Edith Wharton Read for LibriVox.org 1. Like Crusoe with the bootless gold, we stand upon the desert verge of death, and say, What shall avail the woes of yesterday, to buy tomorrow's wisdom, in the land whose currency is strange unto our hand? In life's small market they have served to pay some late-found rapture, could we but delay till time hath marched our means to our demand. But otherwise fate wills it. For behold, our gathered strength of individual pain, when time's long alchemy hath made it gold, dies with us, hoarded all these years in vain. Since those that might be heir to it, the mold renew, and coin themselves new griefs again. 2. O death, we come full-handed to thy gate, rich with strange burden of the mingled years, gains and renunciations, mirth and tears, and love's oblivion and remembering hate. Nor know we what compulsion laid such freight upon our souls, and shall our hopes and fears buy nothing of thee, death? Behold our wares, and sell us the one joy for which we wait. Had we lived longer, life had such for sale, with the last coin of sorrow purchased cheap. But now we stand before thy shadowy pale, and all our longings lie within thy keep. Death, can it be the years shall naught avail? Not so, Death answered, they shall purchase sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Alan Davis Drake. Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. Read for LibriVox.org by Mariah. December 2008, Balboa Island, California. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Firelight by Eugene Field Read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripling 
The fire upon the hearth is low, and there is stillness everywhere, and, like winged spirits everywhere, the firelight shadows fluttering go, and as the shadows round me creep, a childish treble breaks the gloom, and softly from a further room comes, Now I lay me down to sleep. And somehow with that little prayer and that sweet treble in my ears, my thought goes back to distant years and lingers with a dear one there. And as I hear my child's amen, my mother's faith comes back to me. Crouched at her side I seem to be, and mother holds my hands again. Oh, for an hour in that dear place, oh, for that childish trust sublime, oh, for a glimpse of mother's face. Yet, as the shadows round me creep, I do not seem to be alone, sweet magic of that treble tone, and now I lay me down to sleep. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Jim Bloodsoe of the Prairie Bell by John Hay, 1838-1905 Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Fish on the Texas Frontier in December of 2008 well, no, I can't tell where he lives, cause he don't live, you see. Leastways, he got out of the habit of living like you and me. Where have you been for the last three years that you haven't heard folks tell? How Jimmy Blood so passed in his checks the night of the prairie bell? He weren't no saint, them engineers is all pretty much alike. One wife in Natchez under the hill and another one here in Pike. A careless man, and his talk was Jim, and an awkward hand in a row. But he never flunked, and he never lied. I reckon he never knowed how. And this was all the religion he had, to treat his engine well. Never be passed on the river, to mind the pilot's bell. And if ever the prairie bell took far, a thousand times he swore, he'd hold her nozzle again the bank, till the last so got ashore. All boats has their day on the Mississippi, and her day come at last. The Blue Star was a better boat, but the bell she wouldn't be passed. And so she come tearing along that night, the oldest craft on the line, with a nigger squad on her safety valve, and her furnace crammed rosin and pine. The fire bust out as she clawed the bar and burned a hole in the night, and quick as a flash she turned and made for that willer bank on the right. There was running and cussing, but Jim yelled out over all the infernal roar, I'll hold her nozzle again the bank till Alaska loots ashore. The hot black breath of the burning boat, Jim Bledsoe's voice was heard, and they all had trust in his cussedness and knowed he'd keep his word. And sure as you're born, they all got off afore the smokestacks fell, and Bledsoe's ghost went up alone in the smoke of the prairie bell. He weren't no saint, but at judgment I'd run my chance with Jim, alongside some pious gentlemen that wouldn't shook hands with him. He seen his duty a dead sure thing. He went for it thar and then, and Christ ain't a going to be too hard on a man that died for men. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Little Boy Blue by Eugene Field, read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripling. The little toy dog is covered with dust, but sturdy and staunch he stands. The little toy soldier is red with rust, and his musket moles in his hands. Time was when the little toy dog was new, and the soldier was passing fair. And that was the time when our little boy Blue kissed them and put them there. Now don't you go till I come, he said, 
and don't you make any noise. So toddling off to his trundle bed, he dreamt of the pretty toys. And as he was dreaming, an angel song awakened our little boy blue. Oh, the years are many, the years are long, but the little toy friends are true. I faithful to little boy blue they stand, each in the same old place, awaiting the touch of a little hand, the smile of a little face. And they wonder, as waiting the long years through in the dust of that little chair, what has become of our little boy Blue since he kissed them and put them there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Little Mouse that built itself a house in a Christmas cake by Anonymous read for LibriVox.org by Deborah Nell A pretty story I will tell of Nib, a little mouse who took delight when none were near to skip about the house. Her little nose could sniff and smell where all good things were kept and in the pantry well she knew that Mistress Pussy slept. But notwithstanding, in she crept, and on the shelf she found a Christmas cake, the top of which was by a castle crowned. The subject of the present cake was Windsor's mighty walls, with turrets, windows, standard too, and entrance to the hall. Why, here within such walls as these, thought Mousie, I could dwell, and should the cat lay siege to them, defend myself right well. So with her little teeth, which served for pickaxe and for spade, she gnawed right through the gothic door, and thus an entrance made. Then climbed the turret, which she chose her residence to make, and thought to leave it now and then, and feast upon the cake. All this occurred on Christmas Eve, and next came Christmas Day, and then some little folks arrived to eat and drink and play. Right merry are the little folks, and what a noise they make, when Windsor Castle they behold displayed upon the cake. The turrets and the walls they view, the cannon too admire, the soldiers ready to present, and then, pop, pop, to fire. On this, when they had long enough, all exercised their wit, they scrutinized the cake and wished to taste a bit of it. Each guest prepared, the knife was raised, some slices to begin, when lo, with wonder, all exclaimed, oh, I hear a noise within. Poor Marcy, when she saw the knife, at once expressed her fear by squeaking out with all her might, which everyone could hear. Then John, as he the turret viewed, with consternation cried, There is something, I am sure, alive and moving too, inside. All now were hushed and knew not what all this could be about, while Mouse, in fright, forgot her tail, which at the top popped out. Why, well, here's some trick, the lady cried. I'll knock the turret down. Mousie, in terror, gave a leap and ran along her gown. Oh, screamed the lady. What is this? On each side was dismay, which Mousie took advantage of by scampering away. Their fright all o'er Loud laughs ensued from all within the house to think that so much fear should be caused by a little mouse. The children hunted for this mouse, but she was not a dolt to wait till she was caught but made right through a hole, a bolt. The party then began their dance and singing next ensued and then came supper with its cakes and very best 
home brewed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Memory by Abraham Lincoln Read for LibriVox.org My childhood's home I see again, And sadden with the views, And still, as memory crowds my brain, There's pleasure in it, too. O memory, thou midway world Twixt earth and paradise, Where things decayed and loved ones lost In dreamy shadows rise. And, freed from all that's earthly, vile, Seemed hallowed, pure and bright, Like scenes in some enchanted isle, All bathed in liquid light. As dusky mountains please the eye, When twilight chases day, As bugle notes that passing by, In distance die away. As leaving some grand waterfall, We, lingering, list its roar, so memory will hallow all we've known, but know no more. Near twenty years have passed away since here I bid farewell to woods and fields, and scenes of play, and playmates loved so well, where many were, but few remain of old familiar things. But seeing them to mind again, the lost and absent brings. The friends I left that parting day, how changed as time has sped, Young childhood grown, strong manhood gray, And half of all are dead. I hear the love survivors tell How naught from death could save, Till every sound appear a knell, And every spot a grave. I range the fields with pensive tread, And pace the hollow rooms, And feel, companion of the dead, I'm living in the tombs. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Alan Davis Drake. On His Headache by William Dunbar. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Downing. Me hey did yak yesternicht is die to mak the rana micht so sair the magrim does me menye piercing me brew as ony ganye that scant a luke ma on the licht and nu sheer lightly if the mess to dit docht a begust the dress the sentence lay full evil till find and slep it in my head behind Dullet in dullness and distress, Full oft at morrow, he apries, When that me courage sleeping lies, Full mirth for minstrelly and bly, For din nor dancing nor dear I, It will not walken me no wees. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Banks of Deer Creek by James Whitcomb Riley, 1849-1916 Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Fish on the Texas Frontier in December of 2008 On the Banks of Deer Creek, there's a place for me Water sliding past you just as clear as it can be See the shatter in it and the shatter of the sky and the shatter of the buzzard as he goes a lazin' by. Shatter of the pizen vines and shatter of the trees. And I perked and I said the shatter of the sunshine and the breeze. Well, I never seen the ocean or I never seen the sea. On the banks of old Deer Creek's grand enough for me. On the banks of Deer Creek, a mile or two from town. Long up where the mill race comes a loafin' down. Like to get up in there amongst the sycamores And watch the water at the dam a frothin' as she pours Crawl out on some old log with my hook and line Where the fish is just so thick you can see em shine As they flicker round your bait 
coaxing you to jerk till you're tired of catching of them. Might nigh as work on the banks of their creek. All is my delight just to be around there. Take it day or night. Watch the snipes and kill these fooling half the day. There are these here little water bugs scooting every way. Snake feeders glancing round or darting out of sight. And dewfall and bullfrogs and lightning bugs at night. Stars up through the treetops or in the creek below. And smell a muskrat through the dark clean from the old bio. Or take a trunk, some Sunday say, up to Jackson's hole. And find where he's had a fire and hit his fishing pole. Have your dogled with you and your pipe and cut and dry. Pocket full of cornbread and slug or two awry. Soak your hide in sunshine and waller in the shade. Like the good book tells us, where there's none to make afraid. Well, I never seen the ocean there, I never seen the sea. On the banks of deer creeks, grand enough for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Prospis by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman Fear death, to feel the fog in my throat, the mist in my face. When the snows begin and the blast note, I am nearing the place. The power of the night, the press of the storm, the post of the foe. Where he stands, the arch fear in a visible form. Yet the strong man must go. For the journey is done, and the summit attained, and the barriers fall. Though a battle's to fight ere the guerdon be gained, the reward of it all. I was ever a fighter, so one fight more, the best and the last. I would hate that death bandaged my eyes, and forbore, and made me creep past. No, let me taste the whole of it. Fair like my peers, the heroes of old, bear the brunt in a minute's pay, glad life's arrears of pain, darkness, and cold. For sudden the worst turns the best to the brave, the black minutes at end, and the elements rage, the fiend voices that rave, shall dwindle, shall blend, shall change, shall become first a peace out of pain, then a light, then thy breast. O oh, thou soul of my soul, I shall clasp thee again, and with God be the rest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rain Music by Joseph S. Cotter, Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Victoria Grace On the dusty earth drum beats the falling rain, Now a whispered murmur, now a louder strain. Slender, silvery drumsticks on an ancient drum Beat the mellow music, bidding life to come. Chords of earth awakened, notes of greening spring. Rise and fall, triumphant, over everything. Slender, silvery drumsticks beat the long tattoo. God, the great musician, calling life anew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Richard Gorey by Edwin Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Dennis D. Richard Corey Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said, Good morning, and he glittered when he walked, 
and he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light, and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. So we'll go no more a roving. By Lord Byron. Read for LibriVox.org by P. D. Wright. So we'll go no more a roving. So late into the night, though the heart still be as, be as loving. And the moon still be as bright, for the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul outwears the breast, and the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a roving by the light of the moon. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Spires of Oxford by W. M. Letts Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Robinson, Carbondale, Illinois I saw the spires of Oxford as I was passing by, The gray spires of Oxford against the pearl-gray sky. My heart was with the Oxford men who went abroad to die. The years go fast in Oxford, the golden years and gay. The hoary colleges look down on careless boys at play. But when the bugles sounded war, they put their games away. They left the peaceful river, the cricket field, the quad, the shaven lawns of Oxford to seek a bloody sod. They gave their merry youth away for country, and for God. God rest you, happy gentlemen, who laid your good lives down, who took the khaki and the gun instead of cap and gown. God brings you to a fairer place than even Oxford town. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tam O'Shantar by Robert Burns This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Tam O'Shantar by Robert Burns A Tale When Chapman Billy's leave the street, and drew thee neighbours, neighbours meet, as market days are weir and late, and folk begin to tack the gate, while we sit boozin' at the nappy, and gettin' few and unca happy, we think na on the lang Scots miles, the mosses, water, slaps, and styles that lie between us and our hame, war sits our salt sullen dame, gathering her brows like gathering storm, nursing her wrath to keep it warm. This truth found honest Tam O'Shanter, as he frae air a night did canter. Old air, wom ne'er a tune surpasses for honest men and bonny lasses. O Tam! Hadst thou but been sae wise as taen thy ain wife Kate's advice, she told thee weel thou was a skellum, a blethering, blustering, drunken blellum, that frae November till October, a market day thou was nae sober, that ilka melder wi' the miller, 
thou sat as lang as thou had siller. The every nag was cad a shoe on, the smith and thee got roar and few on. That at the Lord's house, even on Sunday, thou drank with curtain and jean till Monday. She prophesied that late or soon thou would be found deep drowned in dune, or catched with warlocks in the murk by Alloway's old hunted kirk. Ah, gentle dames, it gars me greet to think how money counsels sweet, how money lengthen sage advices the husband free the wife despises. But to our tale, a market night, Tam had got planted uncurright, fast by an ingle bleezing finely, with reaming swats it drank divinely, and at his elbow, Suter Johnny, his ancient thrusty drew the crony, Tam load him like a very brither, they had been foo for weeks together, the night drave on with sangs and clatter, and I, the ale, was growing better. The landlady and Tam grew gracious, with favours secret, sweet, and precious. The suitor told his queerest stories. The landlord's laugh was ready chorus. The storm without might rear and riffle. Tam didna mind the storm a whistle. Care! Mad to see a man say happy, he drowned himself among the nappy. As bees flee hame with lades o' treasure, the minutes wing their way with pleasure. Kings may be blessed, but Tam was glorious, o'er all the ills of life victorious. But pleasures are like poppies spread. You seize the flower, its bloom is shed. Or like the snow falls in the river, A moment white, then melt forever. Or like the borealis race, That flit ere you can point their place, Or like the rainbow's lovely form, Evanishing amid the storm. Nay man can tether time or tide, the hour approaches, Tom mun ride. That hour, o night's black arch the key stain, That dreary hour he mounts his beast in, And sick a night he tacks the road in, As ne'er poor sinner was abroad in. The wind blew as twad blown its last, The rattling showers rose on the blast, the speedy gleams, the darkness swallowed, loud, deep, and lang the thunder bellowed. That night a child might understand, the deal had business on his hand. Wheel mounted on his grey mare Meg, a better never lifted leg, Tam skelpit on through dub and mire, despising wind and rain and fire, whilst holding fast his good blue bonnet, whilst crooning o'er some old Scots sonnet, whilst glowering round with prudent cares, lest boggles catch him unawares. Kirk Alloway was drawing nigh, where ghosts and owlets nightly cry. By this time, he was cross the ford, war in the snaw the chapman smoored, and past the burks in Micklestane, where drunken Charlie Brack's neck bane, and through the winds and by the cairn, where hunters fanned the murdered bairn, and near the thorn aboon the well, where Mungo's mither hanged her cell. Before him Doon pours all his floods, The doubling storm roars through the woods, The lightnings flash from pole to pole, Near and more near the thunders roll, 
When glimmering through the groaning trees, Kirk Alloway seemed in a bleeze. Through Ilka bore the beams were glancing, And loud resounding mirth and dancing. Inspiring bold John Barleycorn, What dangers thou canst make us scorn? With Tippany we fear nae evil, we Uskabe will face the devil. The swat say reamed in Tammy's noddle, Fair play he cared na deal the bottle, But Maggie stood right sair astonished, Till by the heel and hand admonished, She ventured forward on the light, And vow, Tam saw an unca sight, Warlocks and witches, in a dance, nay cotillion brent new frae France, but hornpipes, jigs, strathspeys, and reels put life and metal in their heels. A winnick bunker in the east, there sat old Nick, in shape obese, a towsy tyke, black, grim, and large. To give the music was his charge. He screwed the pipes and got them skirl, Till roof and rafters ah did dull. Coffins stood round like open presses That shod the dead in their last dresses, And by some devilish cantrip slight, Each in its cold hand held a light. By which heroic Tam was able to note upon the holly table A murderer's banes in gibbet irons, Twa span lang, we unchristened bairns. A thief new gutted fray a rape, With his last gasp his gab did gape. Five tomahawks with blood Red rusted, five scimitars with murder crusted, a garter which a babe had strangled, a knife a father's throat had mangled, whom his ain son o life bereft, the grey hairs yet stuck to the heft, with mere o oh, horrible and awful which e'en to name would be unlawful. As Tam glowered, amazed and curious, the mirth and fun grew fast and furious. The piper loud and louder blew, the dancers quick and quicker flew. They reeled, they set, they crossed, they click it, till Ilka Carlin swat and rake it. And coost her duddies to the work, And link it at it in her sark. Now, Tam, oh, Tam, Had they been queens a plump and strappin' in their teens, Their sarks instead of creasy flannin, Been snow-white seventeen hunder linen. Their breeks o' mine, my only pair, That ain't were plush o' good blue hair, I would he gin them off my herdies for a blink o' the bonny birdies. But withered beldams, old and droll, rigwoody hags would spin a fall, laupin and flingin on a crummock. I wonder did na turn thy stomach. But Tom kenned what was foe brawly, there was a winsome wench in Wally, That night enlisted in the core, Lying after kenned on Carrick shore, For money a beast to dead she shot, And perished money a bonny boat, And shook baith mickle corn and bear, And kept the countryside in fear. Her cutty sark, o paisley hairn, That while a lassie she had worn, in longitude, though sorely scanty, It was her best, and she was vaunty, 
Ah, little ken thy reverend granny, That sark she coughed for her wee nanny, With twa pond scots, twas all her riches, Would ever graced a dance of witches. But here my muse her wing mon coor, Six flates are far beyond her power, To sing how nanny lap and flang, A supple jade she was, and strang, and how Tom stood like ain bewitched, and thought his very een enriched, even Satan glowered and fidged foo fain, and hotched and blew with might and main, till first a caper thin and nither, Tom tint his reason ah together, and roars out, Well done, cuppy son! And in an instant, all was dark. And scarcely had he, Maggie, rallied, When out the hellish legion sallied, As bees biz out with angry fike, When plundering herds assail their pike, As open pussies mortals foes, When pop she starts before their nose, As eager runs the market crowd, When cat the thief resounds aloud, so Maggie runs. The witches follow with money an eldrick screech and hollow. Ah, Tam, ah, Tam, thou'll get thy fairin. In hell they'll roast thee like a herin. In vain thy Kate awaits thy comin. Kate soon will be a woeful woman. Now do thy speedy utmost, Meg, And win the keystain, o oh, the brig, There at them thou thy tail may toss, A running stream they dare na cross. But ere the keystain she could make, The faint a tail she had to shake, For Nanny, far before the rest, Hard upon noble Maggie pressed, And flew at Tam with Furious ettle, but little wist she Maggie's mettle. I spring brought off her master hail, but left behind her ain grey tail. The carlin clatter by the rump, and left poor Maggie scarce a stump. Now, what this tale a truth? shall read, ilk man and mother's son, take heed, when e'er to drink you are inclined, or cutty sarks run in your mind. Think, ye may buy the joys, or dear, remember Tam O'Shanter's mare. End of Tam O'Shanter the Garden by Ezra Pound Read for LibriVox.org by Robin Ramal En robe de parade Sama Like a skein of loose silk blown against a wall, she walks by the railing of a path in Kensington Gardens, and she is dying piecemeal of a sort of emotional anemia. And round about there is a rabble of the filthy, sturdy, unkillable infants of the very poor. They shall inherit the earth. In her is the end of breeding. Her boredom is exquisite and excessive. She would like someone to speak to her, and is almost afraid that I will commit that indiscretion. End of poem. This recording in the public domain. The Nutcrackers and the Sugar Tongs by Edward Lear, read for LibriVox.org by Ben Cacciaro, December 4th, 2008, State College, Pennsylvania. The Nutcrackers sate by a plate on the table. The Sugar Tongs sate by a plate at his side. And the Nutcrackers said, Don't you wish we were able... Along the blue hills and green meadows to ride. 
Must we drag on this stupid existence forever, so idle and weary, so full of remorse, while everyone else takes his pleasure and never seems happy unless he is riding a horse? Don't you think we could ride without being instructed, without any saddle or bridle or spur? Our legs are so long and so aptly constructed, I'm sure that an accident could not occur. Let us all of a sudden hop down from the table and hustle downstairs and each jump on a horse. Shall we try? Shall we go? Do you think we are able? The sugar tongs answered distinctly, of course. So down the long staircase they hopped in a minute. The sugar tongs snapped and the crackers said crack. The stable was open. The horses were in it. Each took out a pony and jumped on its back. The cat, in a fright, scrambled out of the doorway. The mice tumbled out of a bundle of hay. The brown and the white rats, the black ones from Norway, screamed out, They are taking the horses away! The whole of the household was filled with amazement. The cups and the saucers danced madly about. The plates and the dishes looked out of the casement. The salt cellar stood on his head with a shout. The spoons with a clatter looked out of the lattice. The mustard pot climbed up the gooseberry pies. The soup ladle peeped through a heap of veal patties and squeaked with a ladle-like scream of surprise. The frying pan said, It's an awful delusion. The tea kettle hissed and grew black in the face. And they all rushed downstairs in the wildest confusion to see the great nutcracker sugar tong race. And out of the table with screamings and laughter, their ponies were cream-colored, speckled with brown. The nutcracker first and the sugar tongs after rode all round the yard and then all round the town. They rode through the street, and they rode by the station. They galloped away to the beautiful shore. In silence they rode, and made no observation, save this, we will never go back any more. And still you might hear till they rode out of hearing, the sugar tongs snap and the crackers say crack, till far in the distance their forms disappearing, they faded away, and they never came back. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Twas the Night Before Christmas by Clement Clark Moore Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads, and Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When, what to my wondering eye should appear, but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver, so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the ball. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with a sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed in all fur, from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler, just opening his sack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. 
he was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to work, and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When Omer Smote is Bloomin' Liar by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Downing When Omer Smote is Bloomin' Liar He'd heard men sing by land and sea What he thought he might require He went and took, the same as me market girls and fishermen, the shepherds and the sailors too, they heard old songs turn up again, but kept it quiet, same as you. They knew he stole, he knew they knowed, they didn't tell nor make a fuss, but winked at Homer down the road, and he winked back, the same as us. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When the Frost is on the Pumpkin by James Whitcomb Riley Read for LibriVox.org by B.G. Oxford When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock And you hear the cuckin gobble of the struttin' turkey cock And the cluckin' of the guineas and the cluckin' of the hens And the rooster's hallelujah as he tiptoes on the fence Oh, it's then the time a feller is a-feelin' at his best with the rise and sun to greet him from a night of peaceful rest, as he leaves the house bareheaded and goes out to feed the stock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. There's something kind of hearty like about the atmosphere, when the heat of summer's over and the cool and fall is here. Of course we miss the flowers and the blossoms on the trees, and the mumble of the humming birds and buzzin' of the bees. But the air's so appetizing and the landscape through the haze of a crisp and sunny morning of the early autumn days is a picture that no painter has the color in to mock when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. The husky rusty rustle of the tossels of the corn and the raspin' of the tangled leaves as golden as the morn. The stubble in the furries, kind of lonesome-like, but still a preaching sermons to us of the barns they growed to fill, the straw stack in the meadow and the reaper in the shed, the hosses in their stalls below, the clover overhead. Oh, it sets my heart a clickin' like the tickin' of a clock when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. Then your apples all is gathered and the ones a feller keeps is poured around the cellar floor in red and yaller heaps. And your cider makin's over, and your women folks is through with their mince and apple butter, and their souse and sausage too. I don't know how to tell it, but if such a thing could be, as the angels want in boardin', and they called around on me, I'd want to accommodate em all the whole endurin' flock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Young and Old by Charles Kingsley, 1819-1875 Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Fish on the Texas Frontier in December of 2008 When all the world was young, lad, and all the trees are green, And every goose a swan, lad, and every lass a queen, Then hay for boot and horse, lad, and round the world away, Young blood must have its course, lad, and every dog his day. When all the world is old, lad, and all the trees are brown, And all the sport is stale, lad, and all the wheels run down, Creep home and take your place there, the spent and maimed among, 
God grant you find one face there you loved when all was young. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.